Good morning, everyone. It's Chocolate Clown Kathki Vanini Kanaha. My name is Beverly O'Neill, and I am going to be your moderator today. Uh, before we get started, you just wanted to do a couple little housekeeping, a little couple little housekeeping things here. I want to encourage our viewers, our participants here in the listening audience to uh, let us know that you're there. Why don't you, in your chat, in the chat, introduce yourself and um, tell us where you're from. A couple things here. Thank you, guys. We've got uh, uh, we've got no audio. I have no audio. Okay. Um, for those of you in the participant audience, we're actually using the webinar feature of Zoom. So it, it's only the panelists who will have audio and who will also have an opportunity who, who you'll also see on the screen. So, so Lynn, um, that's how that works is that um, um, if you're, if you can't actually hear me, what's happening is your, um, your computer might not be um, connecting with your audio sound right now. So um, um, I, you know, usually what happens is when Microsoft doesn't update, sometimes it throws off your audio system. So you might want to just reboot your computer. Um, thank you guys for introducing yourselves. We have a number of people here. Paul Pasco from Métis Nation BC. Welcome, welcome. Really glad you can join us. Um, also from, um, we've got um, Nikki Manitoba. Uh, and on, from the unceded territory of the Wicca, um, thank you. And I apologize to anybody where I'm mispronouncing your community's names, but um, thank, I hope you forgive me on that. Uh, we've got Tammy King from Mississauga, uh, Mitchell Riley, Mother Earth Farms in Onega, Ontario, Kayleigh Wright with Northern Food Distribution, Teresa Shelter in the Liver, Little Red um, River Cree Nation, Hans Galbaut, thank you for joining us again, Hans. Um, we've got Harold, uh, great to see you again, Harold. Harold's with the Coldwater Indian Band in La Capa, and he's in, that's in Merritt, BC, and they are um, sending your community and the First Nations and British Columbia love that have been affected by weather here. And also, we can't forget there's Atlantic Canada and some other communities across Canada who've been affected by the floods. And um, um, one of the things that we have learned that we're, we've been talking a lot about in these sessions is about food, food security. Um, it's always been a challenge for many of our First Nations across Canada and has come to the forefront since COVID has started and now with our the strange weather that we're having. So I'm going to actually get into our session, our session now, as I mentioned, feel free to introduce yourself to the session and for those in the viewing, viewing audience, audience, scroll through and you can see who's who's online. So Lisa Troy, Food Sovereignty Community Liaison for Skechis and Indian, Indian Band. Glad you joined us again. And, and Lisa was one of our winners last time. So <clears throat> today is our fifth of our five session speaker series we've been doing every Tuesday. And this is the fifth week of it. Um, and our last and our last week, we do encourage you guys to share with the um, uh, with the organizers, the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council, um, your ideas and your comments in the survey, which comes out after this session. Aaron Bryson is our, our is our techie person, and he sends those he sends those out as well as resources identified during the speaker session itself. So we encourage you to do the survey. It asks you what your thoughts are, how can we make these things these sessions better, and what would you like to hear about in the future. Today's session is on traditions, processing, and pack and storage. This topic came up in conversations that. Um, uh, Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Canada had with a number of Indigenous agriculture people in the spring, and two of the speakers um, are in our session today. That's Don Tabatbongdang and E.J. Fontaine. Uh, Don is with First Nations Growers and their Cultural Food and Seed Preservation Organization. She's going to introduce herself more after. We've got E.J. Fontaine with Amic Cedar Lake Ranch, and and um, they do. Um, uh, labor processing as well. And EJ has been a farmer for pretty much most of his life and is educated in the field. And of course, with each of our sessions, we also do, um, we also make sure that we highlight and, and provide a platform for these great organizations across Canada that are um, working with Indigenous and First Nations on, on ensuring that um, we are reconnected to the land or help us to strengthen those connections and are really a part of the community. So we've got the Makavik Corporation along with the Perseveric Project. Um, so we've got Marion Massey, 
with the Makavik Corporation. And we've got Jordan Stafford, who's with the Nunavut Regional Board of Health and Social Services. And they're going to talk about the food security projects that they're doing and, and how they're incorporating uh, in, in the uh, Nunavik and in the Vic culture into those processes itself. Um, and something to let you know as well, um, some of you guys have been in a number of these other sessions, so you know that they're being recorded. With the recording, we are going to be posting them on the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources site, including clips, so that if you've missed a session, you'll be able to catch up on some of the uh, great things that our previous speakers have been talking about, from, from youth involvement to greenhouses and gardening, aquaculture, chickens, uh, food processing, food packaging, and labeling, and marketing, and and really a wide range of, of, of great conversations we've had in the past. So we'll be recording, um, these sessions will be edited and posted on the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources site in the, uh, in the new year, which is less than a month away now. We also will be sharing with everyone after these sessions um, resources. So don't worry about rapidly writing down any email addresses or websites. We'll be sending those out for out to you so you can focus on the conversation that's been that's been shared. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, there's going to be a post session survey. Our target is to be done at quarter after the next hour on central time. That is 1215. At the end of each session, though, we do three $100 draws. So please stay on. So you must be present to win. And so when we get to that, um, just sh you, you let us know that you're there by, by putting a message in chat if your name comes up. We are pretty ruthless if your name is drawn and we don't hear from you within like 10 seconds and we go on to the next name. So um, I'd like to start by saying I am fortunate today I actually get to be in my homeland. So the different background and you can see in the top corner there is a, it's actually a black and white picture. And that's a picture of Tanaha, and I am a Tanaha person. Some of you guys know us as Kootenays, but um, that is a photograph of, of, of our ancestors. So I'm, I'm pleased today that I am in my homelands, in the traditional unceded lands of the Tanaha Nation uh, here in what's known as the Kootenays in British Columbia today. Um, so if you'd like to also as well, let us know where what homelands you are in. That's, that's great. Um, <clears throat> Um, um, some of you guys have been on these sessions and you've seen that we start our sessions with our introduction from CARC, the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. Um, we have our co-host presenting Somakivik with, uh, uh, with uh, Marion and Jordan, and then we get into a conversation with our Indigenous leaders. In that, that is where you can add your questions and your comments through the Q&A and also through the chat, and I review them and add them into uh, into the conversation itself. So feel free to add, add questions during that. About um, the top of the hour, then we have Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada do some highlights of their programs, plus Farm Credit Canada is going to introduce some of the programs there. We want to make sure you leave these sessions with uh, more knowledge and identification of programs and supports that are available to help you expand or start your new business or new agricultural initiative, whether it's on for food security or or or, um, or a business initiative. And um, and at the end of today, this is our last of our five sessions. So I am going to <clears throat> now ask Deborah. Howard from Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council, if you would like to do a present, uh, tell us about CARC. Good. Well, thank you very much, Beverly. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. On behalf of the Canadian Agricultural Human Resource Council, I would like to welcome everybody to today's Sharing Circle. We're very pleased to be co-hosting Sharing Circles uh, this fall. Um, and to support, in order to support a network of Indigenous agriculture operators and people who are uh, interested in learning more about Indigenous agriculture, um, because uh, we're hoping that this would uh, provide uh, people with information and also support uh, as people continue on their agriculture journey. We hope that the Sharing Circle initiative in general will continue, and we look forward to hearing from everybody today um, about ideas about what we can be doing in the future as far as activities, um, and also here, looking to hear from the group about what the group should look like in the future. So uh, we're hoping that these sorts of activities will continue. Um, next slide, please. So um, 
As a part of CARC, we have been developing over the past few years national occupational standards, which are documents uh, that have uh, come about through consultation with uh, agriculture operators, with farmers. And these documents talk about what people need to be able to know and to be able to do in order to be successful in their role, either, either as a, uh, a farm operator or also a, an employee. And uh, at this point, we're looking for people to, um, it, to review some of these documents because it's our, our intention that we would like to um, provide Indigenous content so that they could become useful uh, for uh, training purposes and also for to help employers uh, working with their staff. So on the uh, slide, we have uh, an example, samples of some of the documents that we do have, including northern livestock, beekeeping, uh, greenhouses, we have field crop production, field vegetable production, we have beef production as well. So if you are interested in um, reviewing some of the uh, documents for, uh, and we do offer a stipend for that, uh, please indicate your interest by uh, putting your name and email address in the chat box and we'll be in touch with you. So thank you for that. Next slide, please. I should also mention that a new program for us is a wage subsidy. Uh, so if your uh, operation uh, has hired or plans to hire in the winter months a post-secondary student who needs to do an internship or co-op program as a part of their, their coursework, um, we would offer a up to $7,500 in a wage subsidy. Uh, it's open to all agriculture employers and we take a very wide view of what agriculture might look like. Uh, so it might be uh, associations, it might be farm work, or it may be other sorts of um, uh, employment um, sort of peripheral, per, I can't say that word, uh, is peripherally associated with agriculture. Um, the program runs until the end of March 2022. However, we're very hopeful that um, we will be able to extend that by a couple of uh, years. So if this isn't possible between now and the end of March, we may be uh, able to chat with you starting in the 1st of April for the summer season. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beverly. Hey, thank you, thank you, Deborah. So um, thank you guys. I see that some people are adding some um, interest in helping out with adding the indigenous lens to their national occupational standards. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to go to our co-host speakers. Um, uh, by the way, Aaron from CARC is going to reach out to those people who indicated an interest in uh, and, and helping out with the national occupational standards. And so he'll be reaching out to you and finding out which, um, which topics or which fields, there's my first fun of the day, fields, fields you're interested in. So um, there, you, there you go. And Aaron's also added into the chat line the links to the CARC um, summer student or student workplace placement program itself. So um, our, our, as I mentioned, we have our co-hosts who are going to share with you what they've been, do, what they've been doing. So we've got uh, Marion Massé from McAfee Corporation and Jordan Stafford with the Nunavik Regional Board of Health and Social Service, Services. They're going to be talking about the Perusvik project in the Cervic uh, Food Center, um, some of the things they're doing there to, in, to promote uh, food security uh, across Nunavik. And uh, that's in none, uh, none of it, as well as in Northern Quebec. So I'm going to ask uh, Marion Massé and Jordan Stafford if you can take yourself off video and um, and uh, tell us what's going on and how can and um, and uh, uh, do you have any recommendations for first Na for other First Nations in our viewing audience on on how we too can can develop programs like yours. So uh, Marion and uh, Marion Jordan, you are on. Well, thanks, Beverly. I think. Uh... I will start and then Jordan could follow. Yeah, okay. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Marion Massé. I'm the work as the Perosetic Project Coordinator for the Makivik Corporation. I moved to Inuktuak, Nunavik to join the Makivik Corporation in uh, 2019, November. Um, and I stayed there for about more than a year. Now it's been more than a year that I work remotely. And before working for Makivik Corporation, I worked for the Inuvik Community Garden Society as a project, project manager of the community and commercial Inuvik Greenhouse in the Northwest Territory. 
Uh, just uh, rapidly about Inupjoak. Inupjoak is the villages of about 2,000, oh no, 1,800 inhabitants uh, above the 58th parallel north in Nunavik, so just above the three lines. Uh, there's no road access and food is delivered through cargo mainly, and also there are two sea lifts per year. So just to give you a little bit of context. Um, Makivik, for those that are not familiar with, is a Nunavik-based non-for-profit organization created as a result of the James Bay Northern Quebec and Land Cree Agreement with the government of Quebec and Canada to administer the funds for the beneficiaries and lead the socioeconomic development of Nunavik. So Peru Civic, uh, which means a place to grow stuff, has been initiated by the Makivik Corporation in October 2017 in collaboration with the One Drop Foundation, which is the foundation of the Cirque du Soleil, to address food insecurity and promote healthy eating habits. Um, we have developed multiple programs uh, and collaboration uh, in part of the Pirol Civic Project, including workshop, training, conferences to really build awareness around growing and eating fruits and vegetables locally. So with our common mission with the Cervic Food Center, we became really close partners uh, through multiple activities, including cooking and growing. For example, a hydroponic tower was installed in 2020 to experiment the cultivation of vegetables all year long to be used in the meal served to the community. So such as tomatoes, peppers, zucchinis, uh, herbs, lettuce. So this is one of the different projects that we develop uh, with Cervic. So, I let Jordan tell you a bit more about this and herself. All right. Uh, so my name is Jordan Stafford. I work for the Munich Regional Board of Health and Social Services on the food security file. So I get to work super closely with Marion and Sirovic on this really incredible project uh, here in Anukjuak, Nunavik. Um, but I also get to support uh, food security projects in all 14 communities of Nunavik. So how it works is if a community is interested in starting a food project or uh, they already have a food security project on the go and they want support with it, they can reach out to us at the health board and we offer support that ranges from financial assistance to in-person support in developing their program or reporting kind of all the things that happen that have to happen for a food security project to be successful. Um, we realize that oftentimes there's funding, but not the, the in-person things and all the nitty gritties of getting things going. So that's where I get to do the fun stuff. Uh, I live here in Anukdurak and I spend most of my days at Sierra Vic um, supporting them on their food center. So Sierra Vic is a, food center here um, and they offer a wide range of programming. It started as a community kitchen activity that was running about once a month uh, for the community. And then there, it really developed out of um, seeing a need for a reliable, durable service where people could turn to for food support on a regular ongoing basis. And then from there, it's blossomed into this beautiful thing that offers food security programming from uh, meal service programs to, uh, to on the land programming, to growing things in a hydroponic container. It's really, really multifaceted. Um, and now uh, with Marion um, and the Perusivic Project, Sirovic is partnering to build a new food center. So it's a really cool thing what they've done with their small space, but it's the, the space is really limited and is limiting their ability to serve the community. Uh, so we're working on building a new community food center that will involve a larger uh, kitchen so more people can come and learn because right now only a few people can fit in the kitchen and a few people can sit. Uh, so it'll be a larger sitting space, a larger kitchen, uh, as well as a year round greenhouse component that'll be there. It, it'll be soil based and it'll be for uh, co the community members, so school groups, community organizations, just regular citizens to, to participate and learn and get their hands dirty growing. So the whole, the whole spectrum from seed to plate um, participating in the in food process at the new center. So that's the dream. That's what we're working towards. Um, so I guess I will just take it a bit over to tell you a bit more, right? Yeah, about just, so today, I mean, we will have a lot 
to tell you about um, the Pierre Civic and Cerevic project and this really exciting uh, community food center. But because the subject is tradition processing and storage, uh, we chose to really uh, highlight several uh, program that we developed. So with Pale Civic, uh, we uh, had installed a hydroponic container in October 2020. That actually took a while to be operated, but now it's it's running. And one of the crops that we start growing in this hydroponic container is a local plant called Hungulit, um, mountain sorrel. Is that just me that heard me in eco? So it was you, it's just you. Okay. Oh, fine. I'll just continue. Uh, so just tell you a bit more about this uh, local plants, the uh, mountain sorrel. It takes a bit longer to grow, like a bit uh, double of the length that a normal crop, so 12 weeks. But uh, it's really important for people in Indirect to grow because it's a local plant. So it's had all of this meaningful and it's actually really successful. Everybody wants really to eat it. Um, so, but there is no really seeds to buy. So what we, what we did, we start first getting the seeds from Kujuak that had uh, started experimenting growing uh, Hungulit in the uh, hydroponic. And then we start harvesting the seeds. So once a year, we, when the plants uh, get rich to maturity, we harvest the plants, except one rack in the hydroponic container. And we keep the plants for three more weeks until the stem become brown and produce the seeds. The, still, the leaves are actually still good to be eaten. So of course we distribute them to the people. And with the seeds, we dry them for two weeks. So we really let them, see, let them sit. And then we put them in the freezer for six more weeks to really put them in this dormancy cycle. And finally, well, we store them either in the dry environment, like in a jar, or we plant them. So that's quite an easy process, but a bit long, and but it gives us a lot of seeds. So that's why we only need to do it once a year. We still have the first year, but this is what actually my former manager told me because she was really the one involved in this. Um, the Rugli leaves, uh, they, uh, when they're harvested, they go to Cerevic Food Center and are distributed to the community organizations, Drop it, uh, they're on the dropping table given to elders. Also, uh, we give announcement to the radio station. And also we really plan to sell them at the store, about $3 a bunch to give you an idea. So that's one of the project. Uh, another one that's really exciting and it's really actually new, it's a traditional plan book. So in the summer 2020, uh, the Pillow project we held the five outings with elders, really exploring, collect information on traditional plants from a new drug. And as a result, we produced a little booklet that really showcase and share elder knowledge about 25 plants. So that's give you an idea. And we, uh, this booklet was actually inspired by other books edited uh, by the Abatac Cultural Institute and written by Alain Curier. And, several elders on this botanical knowledge of four other Inuit committee in Nunavik. Um, we decided to win even further and expand this outreach of the booklet to turn the photos uh, of the plants into images that could be colored. So that's one of images, for example. Um, and so we had 200 copies of that coloring and the books, but we also had numeric uh, PDF copies that we shared to organization partners, and also on our Facebook page. So if you want to see the coloring, you could visit us uh, at the Pillow Civic Project Facebook page. And finally, another project until I leave, uh, Jordan tells you a bit more about Civic. It's the uh, cultivation of uh, cloudberry, which we call Akpik in Inutitut. And the idea was really to get closer to town, to have plants available closer to town. So um, the uh, project manager uh, that I used to work with she partnered with a researcher from the northern shore of the St. Lawrence Gulf to identify, to collect roots and transplant them in a small milk carton to leave them sit for a year or two and see from the one that managed to bloom and make flowers and berries uh, to select them and really select the stronger and better genetic out of the tundra. So a funny fact is to be able to identify which plants produce the biggest berry, we organized the biggest berry contest. So we really involve all the population of Indian to get to identify uh, 
the biggest barrier. And so thanks to this, we involve the people, but we also really managed to um, to collect and uh, select transplant uh, really strong plants. So we're still in the process of having these little plants in the in a box, uh, but the idea is really to expand and having more uh, active uh, available on the village. Dorian, do you want to tell? Uh, I don't know how long we have. I, saw, I know I talked. I talked a lot, but uh, I hope we could still hear a bit more what Silvic does. Yeah, as long as Beverly says it's okay, I can give a oh, quick spiel. Ahead. Yeah, and I, hey, uh, one quick question that came up in the in the chat. So if someone's interested in learning more about how, how you've incorporated technology into what you're doing, you you mentioned it a bit with the hydroponics. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so the really cool thing about Cervic is it's embracing both technology and the traditional food system. So with the Hungu leaf, uh, like Marianne was talking about, uh, it's a hydroponic growing container. So it looks like a sea can uh, on the outside and then on the inside, it looks like a greenhouse. Um, so it's super technologically advanced, but then it's also growing traditional food from the land. So it increases the you know, the season to which you can, you can accumulate uh, Hung Lee in the region. So it's, it's really kind of cool hybrid and a middle ground. Um, but I'm going to speak a little more to other things that Cervic is doing that are less technologically inclined. Uh, so Cervic runs a program called the Alluriate program, which is their traditional, traditional food systems program. Uh, and it focuses on taking youth on the land and getting them and really emphasizing that knowledge transfer between elders and youth uh, so that all of those traditional food system skills uh, continue to be really strong uh, in the community of Anukturuk. So, so this week, hopefully, uh, they're headed out caribou hunting. And uh, how it works is they pair up with the school, but they'll also advertise uh, widely in the community through the local radio or the Facebook and they'll take a group of youth on the land with local hunters they'll, they'll hire as guides uh, and then and it happens through all the different seasons so right now it's uh, the caribou herd is coming close to town but they've been ptarmigan hunting and seal hunting um, uh, ice fishing all of through every season we embrace you know, what the land gives us. Uh, and then from there, they'll learn all the process of, uh, you know, hunting the animal, but then how to harvest it, uh, how to butcher it, and then what they what they get uh, is shared among the participants, or it's brought back to Cervic and used in recipes uh, to be distributed to the whole community. Um, and so it's really kind of shared among um, the community members. So that's the first piece of the program. But then there's also a piece that happens in the community where they hire elders or knowledge holders to come into Cervic and teach traditional skills. So a couple of weeks ago, they had fox skinning um, and uh, they came in and there's a lot of foxes around town right now. Uh, it's, it's mayhem with them all. So people have been really trapping a lot and there was a need for that. So it really comes out of what the community wants, um, what's in season. And, you know, if we have elders approach us and they're interested in doing and teaching how to make fish bannock, uh, then we do that. And so it really varies and it's really kind of cool back and forth of what the, what the youth want, what the elders would like to teach. Um, and, and it's created this beautiful program uh, that's been in operation for three years now. Uh, and uh, is I think one of the most beloved things that Cervic does uh, and really keeps country food at the center of what they do as a food center. Phenomenal. I love it. It's community driven where he said it's what is a what is youth interested in, but also the elders telling you what skills they have and and you know driven by by the seasons itself. It's, it's just just really lovely. Thank you. I, I'm going to bring us on to our uh, to add in our other two guest speakers today. So we'll start with Dawn and then EJ, and then I'm going to just open up for a conversation with you guys based on some of the things some of the things you've said. So um, as uh, both Marion and, and Jordan had mentioned, the topic of today is traditions, processing, and storage. And they they uh, they shared that so much of what they're doing is driven by is driven by the by the community, um, ensuring that there's food security and 
healthy foods itself. Um, Don, you are with the First Nations growers, and that's actually how we first started to become connected uh, through Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council, uh, probably over a year ago. But you're the CEO of the organization, and, and I understand that it's a fully automated uh, garden fresh farm food produce that you're, you've got an indoor growing system that's led to First Nations research development and, and as well as a training facility. You're doing indoor growing. You're providing year round fresh produce um, as well as indigenous herbs and traditional medicines. When, when you and I and um, uh, uh, EJ and his wife were speaking in the spring, you guys also, you also had a healthy conversation on, on the seeds that you're preserving and, and how we can as indigenous people restore a lot of our practices that um, our ancestors perfected itself. So, um, you know, tell us more about um, how you're incorporating traditional products and, and demand and how you incorporate the just First Nations culture and traditions into your into your operations. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that is my vision and I'm working toward of doing that. So I wish I was there, but you're putting that intention out there for me. So miigwech <laughs> for that. Um, been working on this for seven years. And as um, things grow, when you start talking, so one of the things I would like to talk about, again, that cultural food and those traditions. Um, Harmony corn here in Ontario, it's grown south of us. We don't grow it in our area. I'm in Georgian Bay um, in Ontario. So we, I purchased that from farmers, indigenous farmers down south and the curing process has been a tradition that's been passed down from my great grandmother, probably from her mother to my mother now to me. And I've been passing it down to my two daughters, but it's a big process, 10 hours to from harmony corn to actually eating it and that's boiling it um six times the first boil again it's um we have to make our own lye um with hardwood maple ash and again a lot of places don't have it i've learned with sharing um with other elders that what they do is they make do with other trees um with the ashes but they have to boil longer the, um, the maple hardwood ash is the best. It also gives flavor to that corn. Um, so in passing that, again, working with that tradition, it was naturally, we weren't looking for it. It just came and with regards to passing that tradition down on seed preservation, it's interesting because I've been doing a lot of learning still and gaining knowledge. And I don't know if anybody's heard of Creator's Garden, but he's um, Joseph Petawanaquit. He's from Manitoulin Island and he has um, a Facebook page. He does teachings on the medicines. And again, we know our medicines are food. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time again with his teachings and actually going out to the bush, spending time with them, finding out where they grow and with the uh, with preserving those seeds, I'm not picking them and storing them. I'm actually waiting till they're there and I, I I take them and I go spread them closer to where I live. So I don't have to walk so further in the bush <laughs> when I uh, when it comes time to um, harvest those. Um, one of the things um, that I do want to say is that I learned from Joseph is at any type of, whether it's food, medicines, we have to spend time with them. We have to spend all four seasons with them. We have to put our intentions into that growth of that seed um, and that goodness into that seed for it to be abundance. Um, and other than that, I'm just glad I'm happy here to be with you guys. And again, reach out to me. Um, as I said, it's been a vision from my mother of her travels of way up north of what, um, Beverly has explained where we want to go and and eventually be. And I guess I'm at that point in stage of gaining more knowledge. I'm at the funders point and submitting stuff. So we're we're just right on the tip of making a dream come true and sharing all that knowledge with everyone. Um, but other than that, we wish and um, look forward to hearing everyone else's story. Great. Thank, thank you, Don. I love that it's 
it, so you were saying you learned this, you learned how to cure the harmony corn from your from your grandmother and passing that knowledge on. And that's sort of what we wanted to achieve in these sharing circles too, is passing on the knowledge and the experiences in the experience of, pe of people. Um, before we go on to EJ, I wanted to say that um, um, people are interested in the book from, from um, uh, that you guys produced Marion and Jordan. So I know um, uh, Marion has answered that question and she said just uh, um, email her and she will send you a PDF version of, of that booklet. So um, Marion, what we'll do is we'll make sure we put your contact information in in the resource list and people can email you directly for, for it. So that's terrific. Maybe one thing too is CART can add your contact information into their website so people can just link on that directly to, to your organization. So um, I'm going to have EJ um, speak a couple minutes here and then let's get into a conversation about this traditions processing and, and storage itself. So EJ Fontaine, we both, uh, I've known of AMIC for a while because you guys great, you have this great email you distribute on a regular basis. I think sometimes it's a couple times a week. It probably depends on, on what's forward. But we were speaking last year about some of your agriculture training and you said you're a labor, um, you're a labor resource too. But, you know, you've been working in this industry for you know, 20 plus 20 plus years um, in CalCap operations and 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 uh, mixed operations. Um, first training as a student, and then and then five or more years with the Manitoba Indian, Manitoba Indian Agriculture Program. Um, in 2012, you received a certificate of merit from the University of Manitoba Faculty of Agriculture and Sciences for your contribution in agriculture, and you served on the you also served on the board of Food Matters Manitoba. So your, your business AMAC. Uh, delivers cultural support to Indigenous business, including a training, including training, and is pursuing some work placements for Indigenous people on on farms, getting people engaged here. So, how can First Nations and Indigenous people get started in agriculture? What are the steps? And um, in in connection with the theme of today, um, how can we incorporate more traditions into this, whether it's in processing or in storage? So, um, EJ, your thoughts, please. Sure. Um... Bonjour, Takna, we are EJ Fontaine, this Nikal Saigin Doji, Makwa Dodem. I first of all want to say that uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the hosts here for inviting me to, to share uh, uh, in, this, in this Zoom session, but also I'm looking forward to learning from everybody. You know, being a residential school survivor and most of our communities being uh, involved with uh, residential school survivors, a lot of the traditions and practices that we used to have to uh, uh, safeguard food, to store food and to process food have largely been lost. And over the years now, um, we've been starting to reclaim a lot of that. For the last uh, 20 plus years, I've been working with residential school survivors, helping them to um, recover from the experiences that they had from residential school schools. And one of the big biggest uh, things that they've asked us to provide is um, uh, space and also teaching so that they can reclaim the language and the cultures that they lost when they were in residential school. So we've created a place here called Cedar Lake Ranch. It's 100 acres in, Man in uh, Treaty 1 territory in, in Manitoba. And we offer uh, space here for people to come onto the land. Uh, just just being on the land is, uh, is, uh, is a gift and a, a spiritual uh, reawakening for people. Our elders tell us that uh, uh, putting our hands in the dirt is uh, a lot of therapy in that for our people. And so um, uh, we offer that now for the last five years and we've been getting a big response from people coming to the farm here, to the ranch. Uh, we also bring corporations and universities here to learn from learn about our culture and our ways. But um, what I've found out and what I, uh, I know is that uh, uh, just being involved in uh, producing uh, or food on the land or on the water, in whatever ways uh, you're doing that, is, is, is being involved in agriculture. Um, so here we offer uh, small uh, uh, operations for people to be exposed to that. We've been uh, hosting, uh, uh, we've been hosting uh, workshops on tobacco, asema. Uh, we've been hosting um, workshops on traditional medicines. We bring in elders to share that knowledge. But also we have small little operations of chickens where we have uh, 
eggs that we lay, that they lay for us, our ladies, we call them. And then we also have uh, uh, broilers in the spring. So we've been offering uh, small little uh, uh, operations like that that uh, really rekindle the, the, the learnings, the teachings that I've had, but also the learnings that I had from when I went to the School of Agriculture at the University of Manitoba, where I still where I learned a lot about agriculture. But if somebody wants to get into, into uh, agriculture, uh, depending on the size of the operation that they're looking at, it could be a simple uh, chicken poultry operation, 150, 100 uh, uh, egg layers or whatever, like uh, uh, for egg, meat or eggs or goats or gardening. Uh, it basically just takes a, a passion or a, or a desire to want to work the land, to be on the land to uh, um, get your bounties off the land. Uh, one of the first things we do all the time um, for whatever we do on the land is we we have to offer tobacco for the for the gifts that the land gives us. Um, so uh, even when we harvest uh, deer out in our backyard here, we, we take uh, uh, enough deer for ourselves, but we also give some to the elders in the community and we, we offer tobacco, some of that stuff has been lost about how to, how to uh, thank the, the land for what, what it's giving us. We're people of the land. We need to always remember that. So if you want to get into a smaller type of operation, it's basically just having a desire to want to do that, have a passion, a little bit of cash. Uh, not, you don't need a lot of land for chickens or, or that type of operation uh, in a small little building. And uh, just takes initiative and passion to want to do that. If you want a larger scale uh, operation, that's much more complicated and more resource driven. You need to have uh, a lot more resources, cash, uh, educational, uh, land, that buildings, etc. cetera. Um, but the thing that uh, I did, and one of the things that the Manitoba Agriculture Program, uh, and the Diploma of Agriculture Program that I enrolled in, uh, did for us, what was very helpful was that gave us an opportunity to work on an operation where we learn practical hands-on training uh, to what it took to uh, operate a cow-calf operation or what it took to operate machinery on a grain farm. Getting that, getting your hands dirty, getting your hands, uh, uh, practical hands-on training like, like that is invaluable for you if you want to learn how to uh, uh, farm on a, on a large scale or even a mid-sized scale. Uh, having uh, some cash equity is important, like any other business. Farming is a business. You need to have cash to help you with your startup costs. Uh, having a good credit rating, good history, good credit history is, is extremely important because uh, farms a lot, uh, operate a lot on the credit. They get uh, operating lines of credit to help them with uh, their operating costs throughout the year. Uh, some of the fertilizers and uh, equipment and twine and all that stuff costs money and uh, uh, they need to have a good uh, line of credit to be able to purchase that stuff while they're producing the uh, produce that they're, uh, they're involved with. Uh, having collateral is another important thing, you know, unfortunately on the reserves, uh, a lot of times we're not able to use our land for collateral because it's, it's owned by the legally and technically by the government still. Uh, so we have to be able to find ways to uh, uh, get loan guarantees or, or some uh, assets that you have maybe off reserve that you could use for collateral to uh, help uh, start your business. Unfortunately for myself and my wife, we own property off the reserve. Uh, we also had good income. We had good jobs. We had cash flow coming in. So we're we were able to show that we had the ability to repay any financing that we received. So we were able to get financing to start Cedar Lake Ranch and our, also our, our business as a MIC. And so uh, uh, also too, uh, it was sort of a progression thing that I took. I started out with the practical training. I took a three month uh, practical course in agriculture at, that was offered by Manitoba Agriculture. Then from there, I went to a six month course at uh, Cinnaboyne Community College, where I, uh, I learned a little bit more about agriculture, practical agriculture. And then from there, I enrolled in the, in the Diploma in Agriculture 
program and I was able to complete the two-year program. And then from there, I went to work with uh, Manitoba Agriculture Program as an assistant farm advisor and a loans, uh, a loans uh, uh, officer. So I was able to get immersed in the, uh, in the industry by uh, following a, a career path. And uh, it's been very helpful for me to, uh, to, to get where I am. But those would be the same steps that anybody would take to get into mm -hmm. any, any type of business and farming is no different than any other business. Hey, Al Al Almer, I, I love that Shane Noel had added a comment here on Chad and he says, good way to find land is to borrow or, or land share with retired farmers where you farm the land and give them a fraction of the produce. So have you had experience in that? Are you aware uh, of that? No, I have not out here, you know, and uh, uh, it's possibly happening elsewhere, but sure that's an, 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 oppor an opportunity to get land offers there because in my community, Saiging, we have very little land for agriculture. So yeah. if we were to engage in any type of agriculture, it have to be like poultry or some uh, activity that doesn't require large land. Yeah, like, like you mentioned, you guys are doing chicken farming. I understand yeah. that doesn't require a lot. It's fairly easy to get into. Um, and even, you know, if you keep it to 100 chickens or less, then then you don't have to worry about the farm quotas in, in most areas across Canada. So right. a question for all of you, a question for all of you guys. Um, uh, we, were, we've, we were talking about traditions, processing, and and storage, storage here. Um, what has, um, you know, are any of you guys doing anything along that way? And, and what are some of the conditions? If so, what are some of the conditions that they you, people need to be aware of in storing in storing food or processing food for, for various climates? Anyone want to tackle that one? I can start. Okay, go ahead, EJ. Sure. Um, well, first of all, you know, the fundamental uh, teaching that we, re we receive is uh, never take more than uh, mm -hmm. what what you need right and so storing uh foods uh was uh, uh from what i understand was uh, was uh, very limited but we did it to survive through the winters for instance we uh, we ground up our uh, dried and ground up our meat and turned it into pemmican pemmican was uh, something that uh, saved people in early years early days of the development of this country uh, pemmican. Uh, sure. We also uh, uh, stored, uh, 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 smoked our meats, and uh, so uh, our berries. Uh, we we only harvested enough that we needed. So a lot of that stuff wasn't harvested. Uh, well, I mean, stored throughout the winter. We, uh, if it was, it was used in, in pemmican. So uh, fundamental teaching for us was to like only take enough with, for what you needed, right? And so storage was uh, was not something that um, was... Uh, uh, it wasn't a common practice. It was it was common, but it wasn't done on a large scale. You know, we yeah. stored only enough for sustenance, right? For, so, for a specified period of time and for, yeah. for need. Right, yeah, because everything was done according to the seasons. Yeah. Right, so and you, took, you took what you needed in that season. So, and, yeah. so that really, really great value of, of respecting Mother Earth, as you mentioned, yeah. and, and, and ensuring that there's sustainability, but not just for people, it's sustainability for, for um, animals as well. Exactly. And then, then as we got more into uh, relationships with the settlers and colonization, so people started learning how to do canning mm -hmm. and uh, pickling and that kind of stuff. My, my mother-in-law does that every year. And, sort of uh, uh, teaching my wife now how to do that. And so so some of the stuff is, is good, but we don't like uh, pickle uh, uh, cupboards full of uh, stuff. We, we pickle enough for, for ourselves and our family. So fundamental teaching is to be respectful to, to the earth, to what it gives and not to, not to take a lot. Uh, uh, so, but one thing I wanted to share was uh, we recently had some engagement with uh, Maple Leaf Foods. Mm -hmm. they, wanted, they wanted to, uh, and this is about storing foods as well and taking from the land. They want they they were having trouble retaining indigenous workers, yeah. and attracting them, 
And uh, when the ones that they did have had uh, real problems with the way they were uh, slaughtering uh, pigs and and take and like massive amounts of pigs. And so people didn't, our people didn't feel comfortable in that environment because they were taking too much is what the thought was. So, so I told them, well, there's a simple kind of a solution to that is you got to offer tobacco to those animals. And there's nothing wrong with incorporating a little bit of indigenous culture into your operations so that uh, our people feel comfortable uh, working in that kind of uh, environment, but also our teachings are respected. So like uh, uh, everything we do, we have to incorporate our teachings right? and, and that are in our day-to-day -day operations of our businesses. We smudge every day, we do tobacco offerings. It, it, it really helps to uh, uh, retain the, 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 the culture and the traditions that our people have, but also have them respected by other people. And I bet so it's, it's it's creating that work that work environment that workplace that where um, and or a teaching space itself that incorporates indigenous cultures and values and principles in it and um, and uh, and the values. So I'm I'm going to ask Marion or, or Jordan, um, are you guys doing anything with root cellars or teachings of how to preserve food or or, or including jar uh, canning? Yeah, Jordan. I can speak to that a bit. Um, so we don't have root cellars here because it's really cold outside. Uh, so we can you. freeze most. Yeah. Um, it's really easy for storage in the winter. In the mm -hmm. summer, it gets a little bit trickier um, because the outdoors isn't a natural freezer. Um, so we can't just keep things uh, nicely packaged in our storage containers outside. Um, and we need to get a little more creative. But we do, uh, we have done some canning. We've got, received donations before from uh, the Northern and the co-op local grocery stores uh, of vegetables that arrived in the North going a little sour already. And so uh, in an attempt to reduce food waste, they tried making salsa with them and different, uh, different kind of canning and cooking things. So we've done that and it was successful. Um, we've also done more traditional uh, storage of traditional food. Uh, or like canning processes. So misakak is a um, fermented uh, beluga fat. And uh, we've done workshops on that and how you can uh, you know, make that and store it. Um, it's stored in freezers. And what you do is you, you slice up um, beluga fat really small. And then as it, uh, as it ferments, it liquefies and then turns into this really um, uh, strong dip that people use on their country food. Um, and so that was really successful. And then other traditional processing like knee cook, which is dried meats, um, is always really popular. Um, we usually, if we try to process things in that way to store it for later, it's so popular that it doesn't it doesn't last long because it, it sounds like it's really de it's really delicious. And you know, the beluga the beluga fat is a dip that reminds me of the ulican grease on the coast of first of of British Columbia and the First Nations on the coast. That it's uh, the ulican fish that they they um, they put into a vat, and the oil is so rich in the fish that it becomes a spread. So, you know, just reviving those traditions and you said, and it becomes really delicious and it doesn't stay long. So, so what's preserving there? It's, it's not. Yeah. Um, hey, Don, what are your thoughts on this idea of traditions and processing? Um, two things with regards to, um, again, with what EJ says, those teachings are very important to take just what you need, but also sharing what you take. Um, and then it was also done for trade. I do that today with trade with the corn because um, a lot of people don't know how to cure corn or they don't have the time. So um, I do, mom and I, it takes us a good 15 to 20 hours to do one big cure. Um, and I use it for trading with other community members, whether they have fish or they have moose meat. I also um, make corn soup, my grandmother's recipe, and I started handing it out on during the winter months. I'll start that in January to our elders, just because no one has it, and especially COVID, because we haven't been able to gather and get our traditional food. So it kind of led me to start a little soup drive for um, getting some of that good uh, food. And the root cellar, 
It can work. Uh, we used it a long time ago. And when I was a little girl growing up, there was a camp that was just down the road from the house. And I remember it was summertime hot. They used a root cellar for all their food. And it's, and again, it's getting that knack of how far down do you have to go? The support system so it doesn't cave in, but it's possible the root sellers to even go back. That's um, one of the things on one of my list of what I'd like to incorporate with regards to um, my business um, with having a root seller to have those old teachings. And even actually, I even envision a root seller where people are going to get all their pickled stuff from me, eh? as opposed to the regular fridge and freezer and less energy, better on mother earth. One of the things I do promote, promote with um, First Nation growers when I get there, I want to be off the grid. Again, it's all about protecting Mother Earth. And my first question with anything is, what can I do to protect Mother Earth? Because again, that's the first thing we acknowledge. And she, we look after her. She's going to look after us. Um, so that's what I have to share. Oh, excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. You know, the root cellar is it's going to depend on where where you are, because um, your your earth itself, as you said, is is the most important thing. Can the can can your part of the earth sustain it? Does it make sense? And as Jordan mentioned you know, in the north, root cellars just don't make sense, make sense there. Um, some areas you're going to have to dig dig deeper. Um, we are coming near the top of the hour. So I wanted to offer um, to each of our speakers a chance to provide one, one comment or recommendation to our listening audience and anything to do with traditions, processing and storage, you have a recommendation, a, a key learning that you that you have. So I'm going to um, ask uh, EJ, then I'll go to Marion, Jordan, and then Dawn. So one key teaching, final words to offer to our listening audience, and then we're going to go into our resource program. So EJ. Uh, I would like to say to our people, you know, get on the land, get back on the land, because we're the people, we're people of the land. And if we don't get practice our, um, our rights uh, for um, being on the land, uh, there's a good up, there's a good chance this could be taken away from us. Recently, I bought, I started getting my own sons back on the land. Them the, and to know these sorts of things because uh, it's basically who we are as a people. We're people of the land, and we need to know how to work the land. Uh, it's 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 uh, ingrained in our blood, uh, our blood memory, uh, how to work the land. So we need to really get back to working the land in a sustainable way because that's how we did it all our all our lives is uh, and all our through our centuries, our ancestors has lived off the land. And when I was a kid, that's, you know, when we were kids, we don't listen to our elders sometimes, but that's what they told us a long time ago was get out, get out onto the land, learn how to hunt, trap, fish, uh, live off the land, because there's going to be a period in time where we might need those skills again. So that's what I like to offer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you EJ. Um, we're going to go to Marion, Jordan, and then Dawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would say, I think Jordan mentioned it uh, briefly a bit before, but uh, through the PLO Civic Project, really to make sure that all our programs were really aligned with the tradition, what the elders and the people from Inukjuak wanted, we we had really many consultation and we formed community advisory committee that we really um, have meeting with them to discuss and make sure even when you have an agreement of starting a project, you want to make sure as long as you develop, you, you, you stick on the line and also adapt to the reality that also may change. Um, so that would be my addition. Lovely. Adapting and, and guided by, as, as EJ said, fundamental teachings. Thank you. Jordan and then Dawn. Yeah, building on that, I would say collaboration is really key. I think uh, sometimes people have big, brilliant ideas um, and it can be a lot to take on. Uh, and if you're not supported and working with others and there's so many wonderful ideas um, coming out of the North and coming out of all across uh, the land. But um, yeah, like really leaning into uh, working with other people and being open to new ideas. Um, and, and being rooted in the needs and the desires of a community uh, is the most important and having it come from the community is how a project is gonna be successful. 
Love you said rooted. It's a, it's like that's the second fun of today. But but be yeah rooted right in our traditions and our values. Thanks and collaboration. Thank you, Jordan and Don. Your final word before we go into the resource programs. Um, what resonated with me with listening to everybody is applying those seven teachings that we all know um, to our daily lives, whether it's personal life, our work life. Um, we hear them a lot, but we really got to really sit down and think, am I doing that today? It's hard. Every day I wake up, it's a new day and I'm going to try again. Um, and the other biggest thing is share your idea. It's we Our people, we shared we shared, we weren't, we didn't hold on to things. We got to share that idea so we can all flourish and um, everyone live in harmony. So miigwech. Miigwech. Um, and one quick thank, thank you all to Elmer, Jordan, Marion, and, and Dawn for sharing their ideas and experience and, and helping to grow the, in, the in national Indigenous agriculture agriculture itself. So um, I'm going to now bring us over back into our, our presentation here on, on that. So as mentioned with our panelists you and, and links that they had mentioned, those will be shared throughout the, um, uh, in the post session here, Aaron will be sending them to everyone who's registered for this session. So not to worry um, whether you got the emails or the web links itself. So um, we, as we mentioned, we want to and, and all of our speakers mentioned, you know, collaboration and sharing of, of seeds or knowledge itself. And that's where we bring into, we're going into the programs and supports here of government funding and agents. So Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada, in, in these series, we've had either Matt Lefebvre or Dominique Kelly speak. So we're gonna have actually Dominique speak today. And, um, and then I'll mention some bits on, uh, and then Jesse Robson is gonna speak from Farm Credit Canada. So over to, um, uh, Dominic Kelly here. So as he's coming on screen, I just wanted to mention a number of you guys had participated earlier this year in the Agriculture Agri-Foods Canada um, sessions that CARC, CARC had done, Canadian Agriculture had done, and there was a report on recommendations that came out, out of that. Um, the um, uh, uh, federal government had to convert that into French. So that is apparently just recently being completed. So any of you that participated in that, that report will soon be distributed itself. So it's, it's underscored many of the things that you guys have said in these sessions on recommendations and ideas on it. So um, be on the lookout for that. So I understand that should be coming out shortly. So Dominic, over to you, sir. Hey, thank you, Beverly. Um, and uh, thank everyone for inviting um, me and AFC to do, uh, to this session. They've been very helpful for us to learn and understand, um, you know, Indigenous agriculture and, and how we can improve our programs and services. Um, and so my, well, I've been invited here today to speak about some of the programs that we think would be helpful um, to Indigenous communities and peoples looking to um, engage or to expand their engagement in agriculture. Um, the first program, or well, actually it's a service that we have, is called the Indigenous Pathfinder Service. I'm the manager of that service, um, and I work with uh, two colleagues, uh, and we're all pathfinders. And what that means is that we're a point of contact into agriculture and agri-food Canada. So if you have any questions or would like to uh, find out the types of programs and services that we have available, or if you're just looking for advice on a project idea that you have, uh, we're the person to contact uh, for that, or one of the many people, but you can contact us. And then we can discuss what your project idea is, as, help you kind of assess and see where you fit into programs and services, and we'll make recommendations within AFC. And also we work with our other partners and other government departments and provincial uh, governments uh, to help find any funding sources or to be able to get you some information. Um, one of uh, the programs that we do have is called the Indigenous Agricultural Food Systems Initiative. Um, this initiative is um, a partnership we have with Indigenous Services Canada's SPY program. And this is to support any um, Indigenous community project where you're looking to develop agriculture or an agri-food system that is able to sustain itself economically once the, the, the the funding is over. So this is to build a business. This is to build um, any type of community, uh, you know, system that's going to help with food uh, within that community. Um, 
although it says economic in here, it, it's we're not really um, looking for like big economic drivers, but just so that once the funding is done through IAFSI, that there's enough revenue being generated to support the project long term. So that's just to make sure that the lights stay on and you can uh, pay for salaries. So that it's self-sustaining. So it's self-sustaining, exactly. Thanks, Beverly. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. There you go. Um, the other program I would like to talk about is called it's the Egg Diversity Program. Um, this program's uh, it's different in in the sense that this is helping to build the um, the capacity within that within the sector, the Indigenous communities. So this is about knowledge sharing. This is about being bringing people together at uh, say the provincial level or the national level to be able to represent Indigenous uh, needs in agriculture and agri food. Some of the stuff that we actually support through agrodiversity is uh, we do support the Northern Farming Training Institute um, in, uh, I think it's the Yukon, sorry, I kind of, too many projects, I kind of miss uh, kind of where they are sometimes. Um, so we support like a hands-on boots on the ground type program like that. And we also support through this program, um, uh, webinars, conferences, uh, any type of knowledge sharing um, projects. So if you have a project idea or something that's about uh, building uh, community knowledge within your area, province, or nationally, uh, this is a program you may want to consider. Uh, the last hey, program, oh, sorry, yeah. Beverly. A quick question. Um, the Indig Indigenous House Egg Food System Initiative, it says it's July 31st, but um, is there a new Whoa. deadline on that one? Yeah, sorry about that. It's, uh, that was the last round of pro pro program intake that we have. It closed on July 31st. But there's, uh, we're working on that now to to determine when the next intake will be. So we're expecting a decision to be on that probably sometime, kind of uh, late winter, early spring. But when the next intake for IAFSI will be, there will be a new intake. Great, thanks. And then you were going to talk about local food infrastructure fund. Yeah, the local food infrastructure fund. Um, it's uh, it's also closed right now. Uh, the la the latest intake stream, but they are working on having a fifth stream for the local food infrastructure fund, which will be, uh, they're working on it currently. So I'm not sure when that when they're gonna announce that date. Um, what this program is, this program helps communities with um, community-based food security and agri-food systems. So there is no expectations for economic development in this, like uh, kind of the opposite of the indigenous agriculture food systems. Um, so this is about actually um, helping to develop and increase food security within a community. Um, a lot of, or some of the discussion today was about storage, about warehousing of food. Uh, that would be something that the local food infrastructure would uh, would consider as part of their eligibility. So, you know, if you need to improve a uh, freezer storage space, um, even like a storage room, a processing table, processing center, um, that is something that could be considered under this program. Fantastic. Thanks, Dominic. Sure. And if you need any information about this, my, our links will be sent in our email to the Indigenous Pathfinder Service. You can contact each of these programs directly, or you can contact us, and then we'll get you in contact with the appropriate managers. Great. Thanks, Dominic. So as you mentioned, this information will be sent out. We've got a, a flyer for you guys, which Aaron will distribute after these sessions. So don't worry about the getting the email addresses down. We'll get those out to you. And um, as Dominic mentioned, there will be new deadlines for the programs that have expired. Just uh, They're just working on those dates right now. Thank you, Dominic. And now we're going to um, Jesse Robson from Farm Credit Canada. So, Jesse, you are online. Yes, hello. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you for all the presenters here. I'd just like to acknowledge I'm coming from Cree D4 territory here, which is uh, the headquarters of Farm Credit Canada. And I just wanted to highlight some of the knowledge offering FCC has. If you go to fcc.ca slash knowledge, uh, you'll see those topics there at the top of the slide. Um, it's, it's really easy to navigate knowledge websites. So if you click on money and finance or strategy and planning, any one of those topics, what that will do is open up uh, what we call business fundamentals, and it'll be almost like a almost like a course you can take. It's just the free uh, sections online you can navigate through, and it'll be the um, the business essentials of those topics. So, uh, money and finance will open up, you know, ten steps to a solid business plan and and things like that. And so, uh, it's a great place to start 
when you have you know early questions on starting an uh, agriculture operation or expanding your agriculture operation um, some of the some of the points that Elmer highlighted are, are, are really key uh, in in what we've been seeing and what we've been communicating with with uh, indigenous people looking to get into agriculture or communities looking to get into agriculture um, and then uh, another thing that was brought up was uh, sort of that when it comes to a larger operation, there's a lot of things you'll need, like a loan for structures um, and lending on reserve that can be tricky. FCC has been working on uh, improving our own lending strategy so that we're more easily able to lend into on reserve businesses. And so, you know, I, I encourage anybody if, if you're looking at expanding your ag operation or getting into agriculture reach out to FCC. You can do that right through the website uh, on the contact section and someone from FCC can get back to you and, and let you know the ways that we can lend on reserve, whether it's through a community, an individual or economic development corporation. And so definitely there is opportunity. There are ways to get uh, the job done. Uh, and if FCC, um, uh, one of the things we know is that there's a lot of Aboriginal financial institutions who are already working with communities and, and doing great things in agriculture. And so I've highlighted a few there. Uh, I think they'll send out the link as far as, uh, I can actually do it right now too into the chat, just um, a corp, uh, uh, Indigenous uh, association called NACA. Uh, I sent the link there into the chat where you can, you can go to there and see all the Aboriginal financial institutions across Canada. And what that'll do, uh, you, you can click on region, you can see which ones, some are more suited, better suited to ag than others, but uh, it's definitely another great place to start if you're looking at uh, creating some, some partnerships, having conversations and, and starting some conversations. Um, I, I do wanna say a lot, of, a lot of the customers we're seeing, they are reaching out to external experts. There are some communities who do have experts right there on the community when it comes to ag and how to start a business. Others are reaching out to external, either semi-retired farmers or people who do have experience in ag to kind of get the ball rolling and, and creating contracts or partnerships with them to begin growing their ag operation. And, I, and there's a lot of ways you can you can do that. And a lot of people uh, who have had careers in agriculture who, who would love to help out in that sort of thing. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, agriculture, indigenous agriculture especially has big opportunity when it comes to niche markets. One company I encourage you to check out is uh, they're called Boreal Heartland, and they're they're building a business on traditional indigenous forest uh, harvesting and foraging, and creating products you know right onto the grocery store shelves with uh, you know things that using methods that aren't done normally in commercial agriculture, and they're creating a business out of that, and it's indigenous owned and operated. So that's a great example, and there's others. Uh, all sorts, all sorts of companies. There's another one uh, called Manitoulin Brewing outside of, or it's in Ontario. Um, they're doing incredible business, and and they're they're they started very small on reserve, and they started growing and growing and growing. And they, it's interesting. It's it's a really interesting juxtaposition to be a brewery and incorporate uh, traditional indigenous methods into their business. And so I just there's no limits you know really the sky is the limit on, on how you can do things and so i encourage you to reach out check out fcc's knowledge page and um, any questions you have reach out to anybody at fcc through the website or you can reach me as well thank you jesse i love that you've um, you shared some examples of how first nations are incorporating and, and merging culture traditional values principles um and 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 you mentioned forestry which um, um I had prepared this slide. Some of the audience has seen it before. You know, think beyond agriculture because it links into so many different things. A common, you know, as I mentioned, a common theme we've been hearing is that First Nations, Indigenous people are, are getting into agriculture for health reasons as well. And we heard uh, Stephanie Cook speak of the um, the uh, uh, aquaponics vertical greenhouse in, in Saskatchewan, the nation she's working at. So, you know, sometimes our, our initiatives are driven by health, just like the, the initiatives that Jordan and Marion were mentioning today. Look into other industries, other ministries, other departments for what they might have. Think beyond, beyond agriculture because it connects to so many things. So it could be forestry, tourism, health, culture and heritage, 
look into your Indigenous Skills Employment Training Agencies if you're looking for support on the um, labor side or the training side, um, even, even in workplace and um, uh, uh, recommendations or how to develop a training program. Um, Jesse had mentioned the Aboriginal Capital Corporations is funding, and we've had um, um, uh, Dominic talk about some of the federal programs. I've mentioned the pro some of the provincial or territorial ones as well. I mean, again, what we just heard this morning with Jordan and Marion talking about what's happening at at, uh, at Makivik and and. Uh, and that is just phenomenal. We've had people on our line here talk about egg in the classroom. There's also 4-H you can look at. And then also look into connecting with different agencies and that for the expertise that Jesse, that Jesse had mentioned. Um, uh, let's see. Um, in this past, and I'm going to, and, and as I'm just going to go over this very quickly, our friend Aaron is getting ready to do the draw here. So thank you all for participating in, in, in these five sharing circles that we've done over the last over the last five weeks itself so today we i want to express our appreciation to makavik corporation as well as nunavik regional board of health and social services for sharing information and being a co-host of this session so thank you to marion masay and jordan staff stafford also to don taba taba bondung of first nations growers and ej fontaine of amic incorporated as well as cedar lake ranching so um um a virtual hug to all of you guys for that. We've also had in our sessions, uh, the first one was community agriculture and gardening. So we had First Nations Agriculture Association of BC with Trevor Kemp Thorne and, and Harold Aljam uh, on that, as well as Derek Hastings from Trondick Haitian uh, First Nation in Yukon on their greenhouse, Leon Hunter with Métis Crossing in Alberta on the agriculture and tourism ventures that they're doing there. Um, we've had a livestock and seafood conversation with co-hosted by Saskatchewan Indian Equity Foundation, Jennifer Sutherland, talking about the programs they have there. Um, that's one of the egg can, uh, agricultural corporations that that Jesse had mentioned. We had Sonny Gray of the Natural no Dunn First Nation. He um, provides consulting services to them and talked a no number of things on chickens and processing. Margaret Parker from the Aquaculture, um, Aboriginal Aquaculture Association. It's more than oceans, it's water and inland land itself. So thank you to those speakers. We had production, marketing and packaging co-hosted by Ulnuwig Aboriginal Business Services. Um, they service all of Atlantic Canada and they're an indigenous Capital Corporation um, as well. Uh, great website, love that website itself. Our speakers there were Paul Langdon of Ulnuwig, Mike Randall of Lennox Island First Nation, and Jolene Lasky, who um, has Wabanaki maple syrup and, and Howell of Scotland, and talked a lot about processing and packaging. And, and then last week we had National Indigenous Agricultural Association with Dale Warm speaking about the need for national un unity on, on sharing knowledge on this. Stephanie Cook of Office Caspec. Cree Nation with the vertical aquaponics and Jacob Beaton with Tea Creek Farm talked about youth training programs, vial views in the community gardens and some of the things that got started there. So thank you all for joining us for all those sessions. As I mentioned, these will be posted on the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources website um, in, the, in the new year itself. Thank you all for joining us and, and thank you all to our panelists, to Don, EJ, um, Marion, as well as to as well as Jordan and our and our resource people, to, Je to Jesse and to Dominique for sharing the information again to the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council for making these sessions possible and all of you for being a part of our listening uh, being a part of our listening audience I want to thank you all from um, from my perspective for sharing for sharing your knowledge and for today I mean from all of these sessions I think the key words have been collaboration um, practicing our seven traditional teachings itself and incorporating them in listening reconnecting to mother earth only taking what you need and um, and the value of restoring our cultural values principles and reconnecting to the land to create food security as well as good health for our people and some um, and participating in, and leading our economies. So again, thank you to everyone for being a part of these sessions, wishing you a very happy holiday season and, 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 and sending love and praying that next year will be a great year for everybody and everyone remains safe. Thank you guys.